Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Philbrick. I'm our campus's director of communications, and I'm also on the uh, board for the Franco-American Collection here as well. Um, today's lecture is part of the Franco-American Collection's spring lecture series, which is organized in partnership with the faculty here at USM LAC, and it's made possible with the support of the University of uh, Maine Systems Diversity Committee. Rhea Cote Robbins is a professor of Franco-American Studies at the University of Maine and is the founder of the and executive director of the Franco-Americans Women's Institute, uh, which is an organization of uh, women who gathered together as a force for the specific purpose of promoting Franco-American ethnic women's voices in a variety of different forms. Uh, she has worked as the editor of an international bilingual socio-cultural journal titled The Forum, and in 2004, she received an honorary doctorate from the University of Maine at Farmington. So je présente Maria Cote Robbins. Okay. Merci. Bonjour tout le monde. Bonjour. I wanted to um, <clears throat> start off today with a reading from my book, uh, Down the Plains, in um, honor of my mother, Mama, I guess when on this journey preparing for this talk, it was difficult. This was not an easy talk to prepare for. It did not uh, come automatically. At first I was thinking, okay, but I write every morning in my journal. I'm kind of addicted to writing. And um, so I'm on my 160th journal. So I've been writing in journal since, um, uh, well, I started when I was in the sixth grade, but it was sporadic. But um, since 1980, every day, pretty much. So, anyways, I wrote this talk maybe five times. There were five iterations of what it is I wanted to present today. And what I came out with was, uh, well, you'll hear that. But the thing that I want to start with is uh, chapter 36 uh, from Down the Plains. And before each chapter, I have a quote from the 1870 or 1871 Waterville Mail. And the reason I did that was I wanted to know the reception of the French when they immigrated to Waterville. A correspondent of the Boston Traveler says that if women were as particular in choosing of a virtuous husband as men are in choosing a virtuous wife, a moral reformation would soon begin. And that was December 30th, 1870. If, were, if women were as particular in the choosing, this is chapter 36. I'm going to read a very short part of that. And this is dedicating this talk to my mother, uh, Rita um, St. Germain Cody. I seem to see a wave engulfing the place where women stay. I am my mama's only daughter. My sense of self can sometimes only know or recognize me when I remember my mama. My understanding of my being in the present realizes itself by looking at my past through a telescope. It begins in her face, her smiling face, and I think of tanned wrinkles or a frustrated, in a hurry, run ragged woman. That was her favorite thing to say. She's always in a rush. I experienced a comfortableness and acceptance with curious objections that came from her. Sometimes she did not recognize me. From the shores of Mama, I was launched to the shores of all others. That is why I need to think of her anchoring self, her as a point of origin and departure, her as central, each step I take, I take away from her. It feels as if my life is a movement away from my mother's spirit into a life of my own. For this uh, talk, which is also part of a course um, that some of the people here are, have taken, representations of motherhood, I recommended a reading um, which I found when I was editing the forum at the Franco-American Center and I reprinted it in the forum in um, April of 1988. It was originally written um, 1985 American Review of Canadian Studies and the author is Jill Bystandinsky. I don't know if I'm saying that right. She's no longer at, at Iowa. I think she's at Ohio now. But if you go to the fawi.net website, so it's F-A-W-I dot net, and there's a search, a Google search, and just type in Jill, J-I-L-L, -L, it will come up. And the title of her paper is 
Minority Women of North America, a comparison of French Canadian and Afro American women. And I was absolutely amazed when I read this piece because of the comparisons that this person does with the French Canadian, she calls them French Canadian, she's talking about Franco Americans, and of the Afro American women who were brought here to this country as slaves. And so the premise of her piece is predicated on the fact that uh, what women's lives were like in comparing that the family, the family is valued and that the hard work is part of the mantra that these women are, were brought up with in the, in the uh, preservation of the family. And so you have within the context of this piece you know, her examples, and I can go back to that because I do have some questions that maybe we can talk about if people want to discuss that. So that is one of the pieces <clears throat> that I gave for the class. The other one that I had to do research, I did not write from um, what I would call memory or experience. I wanted to have input in regard to this talk, and so one of the articles that I found, it's interesting, the dearth of material that, you know, you looking for stuff, you know, in terms of the whole motherhood um, process, you know, for the Franco-American or French-Canadian, and I had to cross over because for me the borders kind of melt with the Quebecois. So the one that I did find was the mechanization of motherhood, images of maternity in Quebec women writers in, um, of the Quiet Revolution, and the Quiet Revolution was a um, event that happened in Quebec in the 60s. We were very aware of it in my house on Water Street in Waterville at the time. And what was going on was that the people in Quebec finally said that's enough with the repressions and the whatever was coming down on them and in dictating their lives. And so they passed through what is called um, the Quiet Revolution. and. I think it freed up their voice in so many ways that I hope at some point that the Franco Americans or the French Canadians here in the US, um, we could use a quiet revolution, I think. That's my opinion. So part of what I looked at, for me anyways, um, well, I'll read what I wrote. This is one of my, this is my fifth and last and final, because I said that's it, I'm not writing more about this subject. <laughs> Although I did write two more, but <laughs> that was some other point, but anyways. And it was not easy. So sometimes, anybody here procrastinator? Because I teach a <laughs> academic recovery class, and I said to the students, "Do we have anybody here that likes to procrastinate?" You know. So we talk about the kinds of procrastination, and I will do. I'll clean the whole house before I do something. You know that I should be doing. So my first words here is subject avoidance. So I did that. Okay. We, we passed through that tunnel. Motherhood, and. One of my final pieces came down to the fact that that's a foreign word to me. For me, mother is mama. And today, there was a piece on Facebook that was going around, never underestimate the power of grandmas. Well, I took it and I redid it. I crossed out grandmas and I put in meme. And I put it back up and it got passed around, I don't know, maybe five times and people like, 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 right? So someone in, at Fort Kent said, well, now and you know even I get that one she said you know like grandmas to Mame and I'm like wow I said even I'm doing it and I don't necessarily need I need to be told to bring that to the conscious level that grandma for me is Mame or like my grandson who introduced me to one of his friends said this is my grandmother because he calls me Meme. <laughs> so he had to wait and he did an instant translation <laughs> for the folks. So, yeah. So, anyways, for me, motherhood would be m Mama. So, you know, we would have to come up with some more terms to fit with the motherhood. But the cult of true womanhood, which in studying literature, that would be um, the times when, you know, in the 1800s, that the womanhood, you know, the cult of true womanhood was, you know, how to be the best woman in the U.S., right? Motherhood turns into mama. The word changes to define the role or roles. What do I say? Such an obvious topic, as big as God, really. But what words can capture the essences, not essentialisms, 
of the role the mama plays in the French heritage culture, who sometimes might be either, it might be either gender. So you have a lot of situations, a lot of stories where if the mother passes away, then the father does both, you know. And or people, with, you know, today you have, you know, transgender. So I'm trying to think of it in terms of modernity, not just in the past. <clears throat> So depending on the reasons or circumstances, past or present, there are or never were any ideal circumstances. It doesn't exist. If I were to pick literatures of all types and venues, plus film, the arts in general, as the mirror from which we get our mother reflections for the culture, or the words to describe motherhood, strong. You constantly hear that, right? A woman is strong. She has a strength. Well, for me, I've changed it. Intrepid is my last term that I would use. Before, because using strong says what you hear, but I think intrepid says it best. Motherhood is, is a subject one thinks they automatically know. Everybody knows motherhood, right? We automatically understand that. All there is to know on the subject from experience, having a mother or being a mother, minus the official words on the events, studies, data, figures, tendency, trends, fashionables, taboos, verbiage, doctor's opinions, how-to manuals, religion, religious import, interferences, and dictates, etc. Plus literature and all its bias and focus started me on a journey reading the research, literary criticism, and my natural predilection towards resistance of the entirely sentimental, saintly, always do-gooding mother and grandmother that really robs the woman of her full character. Give me the complex, compl complicated woman any day, the truth talkers. Interpretations and their limitations. Serious hindrances result because the myth becomes a legend and the cult of true womanhood as told in the many faceted multiple realities in the untold of women's lives. As much of women's lives are not even talked about. Die in effigy. Lies told in effigy mocking representations of the actualities of women's lives, their struggles glossed over. For the sake of what? Truth sacrificed to maintain the dominant culture in denials, lies told to eradicate multiple perspectives. No problems here. So there's no, there is not a, a necessarily looking at and telling the whole part, right? And if the women are not talking for themselves, or as the French feminists say, writing the whole body, I question the telling. Trained as a resistive reader, literary criticism, I question the gaps in the story and stories. Good old days never existed. Compounding fallacies and fantasies solves nothing because the reality of storytelling is the most important component in prob is problem solving. Because the reality of storytelling, I'll repeat it, is the most important component is problem solving. So when you tell stories, in effect, you are problem solving. Life asks questions and the manner in which we respond depends on the amount of freedom of voice and access to story that we have. And so the amount of story that a Franco or a French Canadian, however you want to call it, French heritage woman has, to her being able to tell her full story is getting closer to the truth of what it is that these women, well, you know, what the women's lives are like. He, these are some questions that came up in my mind in looking at this um, and, I, and I'm trained as a visual artist, and so I turned everything into an artistic problem to solve. That is how I was trained. And so for me, I situate my work in a question, and then I proceed to answer it. And these are some of the questions that came to me as a result of this opportunity to come speak to you today. So and I thank you for that, because this is really, um, I learn every time I do something like this, you know. In the French heritage culture, how is motherhood seen or told? And I'm not talking about just in the past, but even to today. Is it valued or judged? And who is doing the telling? And what um, is their point of view and or their bias? Because in every piece of writing, there is a bias, right? There's, and that is one of the things that you need to look for. You know, what is their point of view? What is the bias that they're coming out of? <clears throat> Who has the right or authority to talk or tell? I taught a course on, um, it was called Contact Lit. So it was the Native American tribes that were here and the cultures that came here. 
And my interpretation of those types of writing is who is allowed a voice of violence? Because the one that is allowed the voice of violence is the one that has the dominance in the culture, in the storytelling. And in telling the story, what are they saying, whoever is doing the talking? Is the motherhood story leaning more one way or the other? Because there would be something in the story that talks about that particular woman's life and it's, um, you know, whatever is unique. Because with every person, even though that there are who knows how many thousands of stories, there is always something unique to that. Is the woman a woman full-bodied or fragmented, a caricature rather than the fully developed person? In other words, if I was to say here, does she bleed? Does she um, carry children? Does she live a full life? And so, you know, the access to subject is really important. Is the research viable, reproducible, based on standards that actually reflect the diversity of the group? Concrete, varied enough, predetermined outcomes only prove, such as the women in the culture are strong. There are some that are not strong. And that, to me, is where the interesting story begins. Because not all whites are the same. And you hear that, right? You'll say from um, a discussion of people of color, the whites. Well, I say, in thinking about uh, Jill Bystandinsky's, um, maybe I should stop saying her last name because I'm not quite sure if I'm saying it right. Um, she's talking about comparing a culture of whites to the Afro-Americans. And so I would imagine that that would blow some people's minds, you know, to think that. But as she says in the beginning of her paper in White Niggas of the North, which is how we were, how the French Canadians were known, and my brother who would not have read this book said, nous, nous sommes des nègres, nous autres. I mean, he knew this. I mean, this was something that was in the culture. Pierre Verrier calls attention to the similarities in status between French Canadian and Afro-American people. Just as American blacks had first been imported to the New World to serve as cheap labor and continue to be exploited for the better part of three centuries, so too were French Canadians since the establishment of New France in the 17th century, servants of the imperialists, and still constitute a reservoir of cheap labor mistreated and trampled underfoot. This is a quote from Vallier. <clears throat> uh, although cognizant of that particularly difficult situation of French Canadian women in the struggles of the Francophones, Vallier did not consider the parallels between them and their black US counterparts. In other words, even in a man of the culture writing the book does not bring in the aspect of the women's lives. And so that is a problem, and that's what she talks about in, in her article. And how to formulate a definition of motherhood that constitutes multiple realities reflected or just relegated to the stereotype pie? Who can or cannot handle the truths and why? France trends at the moment, ideal, um, and you've seen the cover of the books, French Women Never Get Fat, uh, Bringing Up Bibi. Um, there are several titles of how those are the ideals, how French parenting, they kind of like uh, laissez-faire a little bit, not so much of the helicopter parent. So that's kind of like, you know, you're set up against these standards, whether conscious or not, you know. Um, the quiet revolution happened in Quebec to shake, shake off the shackles of the restraints. La revanche des berceaux, the revenge of the cradles, which was set up at the time of the colonization in Canada, that the church uh, preached motherhood from the pulpit so that the uh, population could increase. And that was how they were going to overcome the fact that they had been colonized by the English in 1716, 1763, with uh, the takeover by both of the Quebecois and the Acadians. And there were other times in the Canadian history that the Canadian government itself was paying women who had 10 or more children at one time, they were, the families were paid um, uh, a premium, and then I think it, there was a second time in history, I think it was 12 or more. And so the whole um, process of motherhood was attached to either uh, saying that, you know, we will overcome this, uh, co you know, being colonized, and or uh, to, you know, bringing money in for the family. So we have not had, um, the quiet revolution, the Franco-Americans. And I think it shows, because I think we're kind of stuck at times in our definitions. 
And the Franco-Americans are caught in a mythic past while living in a completely modern and current present. So I had to face my own truth as a result, and after having read a few more pieces of research and literary pieces, thinking on other representations of motherhood as subject, current authors' works. Ledoux, Beaupré, Roy, Camille, films, uh, Paul Paré, poems, a uh, story about his mother's cleaning rag, Hergeny, it sticks in my mind, and that was a story that was in the forum, and the, the definition of his mother and her cleaning rag, you know, Hergeny. Taboos about certain subjects due to the already endangered species event of the fragility of the Franco-American culture still marked by immigration other. And um, I know Bruno Diaz, and he had um, a piece on the radio about his language and coming from the Dominican Republic and how that language for him was part of his negotiation to being in the U.S. And hearing that, and I emailed him, for me, even though I'm fourth generation from Canada, I'm still immigrating. French was my first language. And so the part of it is, is that you never get over that immigration process until you come to the point of assimilation, which is probably my kids, but I'm not quite sure, because they also have attachments, which I think it's, it's built in, you know. Up against the absolute, um, absolute, absolute of Mother France, always being judged by France. The event and act of mother tongue. Access or not to the mother tongue. And so it doesn't just come to the definition of motherhood itself, but it's like, what do we speak? Do we speak the mother tongue, or are we speaking the, uh, the language of the colonizer? Orphaned as a result without the language mother tongue, cultural child without a home, danger of telling truth unless freed by our own Quebec revolution, uh, quiet revolution. And resistance at every turn and how to express the stories and real stories of real women's lives. Not just the sainted mama. Walls, barriers, hurdles, denials, almost insurmountable in order to just plain tell it like it is. What can I say? Franco-American women, modern women use birth control, have abortions, divorce, attempt at, and sometimes fail being mama. Some carry on no matter what. Single mothers deal, work, and achieve in the public workplaces. A full-bodied experience by all, and there are typical stories, by each and every one with variations. One could call them stereotypes because stereotypes do exist. And they exist because that is what we see and the onset. But we need to go beyond the stereotypes. But no one can be deluded to that just one thing. That cannot be representative of the women. Whatever the stereotype, you know, to say that the woman is strong, she's so much more than that. She is that, but what else? We want to know. Um, Jill's piece is important because she breaks the rules. She begins a dialogue on the diversities present in the women's lives. How can, they be li how can their lives be characterized and marked as distant, uh, distinct, different, and unique? Not just a saint or a battle axe, a ball buster. Overbearing, unpaid representatives for the Catholic Church delivering up sacrificial clergy religious to feed the system. Where can the truth of the actual women's lives be found, told, measured, recorded? Without sanctions placed on the verbiage, words to be paid in taxes owed to whomever, whomever happens to be collecting in that era. Extortion fees extortion fees paid to silence the truths. Reasons why the truth would be told. Certainly not for re revenge, but to keep the record straight. Boundaries not, re not redrawn to rewrite revisionist histories. I really feel it is important to be aware when revisionist histories are going on, and there are a lot. We are surrounded by that. Rhodes remark, remark to tell the dominant society's point of view story. And that's an actual thing that's happening in my town. What, what is are these women's collective stories? Because it's interesting that how the Franco-American culture, still being at risk, has this concept of working out of the collectivity as opposed to the individualism of the US. And so you see that present in the literatures, you see that present in the way that people talk, 
You see that when there is a public shaming, is that the group is shamed, not just the individual that brings shame to the group. Um, that is one of the subjects that I look at closely when we look at the Franco-American women's experiences in the class, is what are the effects of shaming on a collectivity, and why is it that we own that as a group, as opposed to um, individualism. <clears throat> Whereas, <clears throat> say, an example would be, if a man commits a crime that is not of the Franco culture, but is just in society, not all men are blamed, but if you see someone that is of the Franco culture that does something, there is this tendency to um, assign blame to the group, maybe even the mother, I have no idea. The blacks suffer from that as well. So, What are the characteristics that can be drawn of the women? The manner of dress, decor, expressions, inclusions, exclusions, joining what groups? Mothering techniques, uh, disciplines, and endearments are not in the routines of women's lives. Birthing techniques, urban, rural, both in between, gay, straight, bi, liberal, conservative. Choices. Do the women of the culture, past, present, and future, have choices? I think of my mother, she certainly did not have choices. She came from a family of 17. She was number 16. There were a set of twins, 15 and 16 were twins. There was a last child that was born after her that had um, spinal meningitis and was um, deaf as a result. So when I think of my life in the upward mobility as a woman in the culture, I mean, it's almost stratif stratospheric compared to my mother. So it's, uh, you know, to, and then you think of that in terms of the culture, you know, that we live in, say like for me being a writer, you know, we have the bestseller mentality. Well, part of it is that I don't buy bestseller mentality, and the reason being is that we are all storytellers, and I have a feeling, for myself anyways, that that has been robbed. We've been robbed of that. It's like you said, natural conversation at the beginning. That is the thing. You know, we automatically go to representations of ourselves and telling the story. And the thing that I talk about is, how did your family tell the story? Because that is as unique as your face, as your handwriting, as your fingerprints, there are, there are ways that families told story, and I think if we could do a little less with the media, we might find ourselves natural conversations again. Um, of the plethora of the living in the community, where, I, where are the women's marks? Where do we find evidence of the women in our community? Not just traditional uh, pious, piety, moral do-gooders, goody-two-shoes, sacrificing to the point of oblivious, but they exist. I know one. <clears throat> Rocking chair queens of all she surveys, know those two. Strong arming everyone with an iron fist. Someone who takes her daily shit, pisses, bleeds once a month, spreads her legs or sucks in return, and is also a suckler with baby at the breast or bottle fed. In other words, whole body representation. Real women of the cult of real women. Anything else is not considered authentic. Give me full body character any day over the stilted, saintly, sacrificial, in denial, in denial iron lady in a private lamb in public, you know, iron lady in private lamb in public. There can be no other. And why do people work or hide behind stereotypes? Use stereotypes as markers of motherhood mamas. Thousands of tiny acts of selflessness can be seen other than the biggest and, and can be seen, and I consider motherhood to be the, uh, the biggest volunteer organization in the entire world. WW Woman. Fight for the cult of truth and the true womanhood full of bodiness. So, <clears throat> some of um, what I was looking at when I was looking at uh, Jill's paper I have some thoughts and questions, but if anybody has any remarks at this point, maybe that would be a good thing to kind of stop. And